So we're uh, still in one of the more favorite sections of the textbook in the class for me, that's turbo machinery, especially pumps, 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 pumps. But once you understand pumps, then you can look at fans and blowers, compressors, you can look at all kinds of turbines because they are rotating machinery, okay? Um, we did look at a pump last time. This was a performance curve uh, for a particular manufacturer of a pump, the particular model number. It runs with the motor that is the nominal speed of the motor. It's an uh, AC induction motor uh, and it drives this pump. Uh, it has a, a split case, so you take it apart and uh, typically the top and the bottom separate. And then it has double suction, meaning the water comes, let's say, in and then goes on both sides, splits, and that way there's not a net thrust one way or the other on the axis of the shaft that's rotating, and then it's discharged. I believe that's the discharge side to it, but I could be wrong. Um, we talked about how you characterize it by the flow rate and the head, and you have performance curves depending on the size of the impeller that's enclosed in the case. Nowadays, you basically get the impeller that's going to give you the best performance, and you really don't uh, change the impeller size much. You could still change it, but uh, you would just have, let's say, pick this one, and it seems to have pretty good efficiency, and you'd want to operate around this best efficiency point. Here are your efficiency lines coming like this, and it'll operate fine over in here and off to the side, but you really don't want to go way down in this region. And yes, sometimes you can deadhead a pump and it'll run, but it's just going to be like an egg beater and it's going to heat that water up and heat the, everything up and you just don't want to do that for very long. All right, we talked about the net positive suction head. Somebody says, what's that for? It's to avoid what is it? Cavitation. cavitation. It's to avoid cavitation. So you want to uh, make sure that you're supplying the inlet to that pump with enough pressure to the fluid such that there's no cavitation as it goes through the pump. Okay. And let's keep go on. Does AC induction mean you're just spin a magnet inside of the coil? Yeah. Uh, the AC induction. You don't have, it's not, it's a, uh, Exactly it. It's you have the electric current makes an, a, a magnetic field, which interacts with another magnetic magnet to to uh, induce torque on a shaft. So in the way. That's right. And so there's a voltage drop across the supply. So you have current, just like a regular, even a light bulb. You have. Um, the voltage drop across the light bulb and the current through the light bulb. But it's not a resistive heating like a light bulb, it's an inductance. Yeah. And they're not trivial. Okay. But there's just a few characteristics that we want to understand about them, especially as mechanical engineers. Let's take a look at this problem. It's a closed loop system. In a minute, we're going to talk about an open system. But a lot of systems are closed. Meaning, yes, this may be an elevation change, but as the, you're pushing it up, 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 it's also coming down in elevation. And so if you take a look at the whole loop, the change in the elevation cancels out on a closed system. That doesn't mean that the pressure isn't high at lower elevations than at higher elevations. That's still true. But that this pump... It's not like it has to pump it up and then discharge it to something up here. Um, that's going to be an open system, and it'll have a different characteristic. So this is a closed system, and there's a lot of closed piping systems that we deal with in practice. So we have water. There's the density and the viscosity. It's pumped at a given flow rate, which is translates about 5,000 GPM through a piping network. That is a 12-inch diameter pipe. There it is in centimeters. It's 700 meters or 2,300 foot long, having uh, six fully open gate valves. And when it, the gate <coughs> valve is fully open, it has a loss coefficient of 0.2 each of those gate valves, and there's six of them. 
So you look at the number six and you have look at the loss coefficient for each of them. There's 10 elbows with a loss coefficient of 0.3 for each of them. The piping system provides water to two heat exchangers. Here's one, here's one. And they have a large loss coefficient to push it through the heat exchanger, 20 each. It's in the loop. The pipe has a roughness. So there's the roughness of the pipe. Determine the head loss in the system. And guess what's going to have to compensate for the head loss? The pump. That's the purpose of the pump. You want this flow rate. You want this many GPM or whatever flow rate it is, you know, cubic meters per second through that system. You're going to have to get a big enough pump to supply that flow rate and overcome that resistance. So what do you do? You just start Bernoulli's equation, easy way to look at it, and go from, let's say, 1 through the system all the way to state 2. So um, let's t do, write it all out if you like. You have the pressure at 1, you have the 1 half rho V1 squared, you have rho G Z1, and any head gains, well, we're only going from 1 to 2, kind of like the outlet of the pump to the inlet of the pump. So there's no head gain, all right, or pressure gain because we're writing it in terms of pressure, uh, equal to the pressure at 2 plus 1 half rho V2 squared plus rho G Z2 plus any pressure losses. What are the pressure losses going to be due to? The majors and all the minors. So when we look at this, the, the, uh, the, uh, the speed, the, the inlet pipe and outlet pipe at 1 and 2 to the pump are the same diameter. If they're going to have the same below flow rate, they're going to have the same velocity. The elevation's the same. And so what we find is that the pressure loss is equal to basically there's no pressure gain in this system it's going to be the difference between uh, p1 minus p2 that's the pressure gain across the pump so from one to two there's no pressure gain but from two to one there is and that's the, the pump <laughs> okay so what is the equations for the pressure loss well we're going to have major and minor what are our equations for the major loss? A uh, friction factor, length of the pipe divided by diameter, times, I'm going to put it over here, one half rho v squared. Because each of these is proportional to the same velocity pressure, the minor losses and the major losses. And then we're going to have how many uh, gate valves? Six of them. Each of them have a loss coefficient of uh, let's say p p p uh, k of the, the the valve and then maybe I should put number of valves make that very generic right the number of valves times the k of the valve the loss coefficient of the valve plus the number of elbows times the k of the elbow plus the number of heat exchangers times the k of the heat exchanger <coughs> so we have major and minor losses there you go. And now we can look to substitute numbers. Well, these are the easiest. We we'll have a K of 20 for each of the two heat exchangers. We have a K of 0.3 for each of the 10 valves. And we have a K of uh, 0.2 for each of the no, elbows that was. This is now the six valves. And now we have a little bit of work. We know the length, that's not too hard. That was 700 meters. And we know the diameter, that's not too hard. It's 0 0.305 meters. But what about that friction factor? How do we get that friction factor? This is where I always would get tripped up as a student. It's like, okay, now we got a lot of work to do. How do I get that friction factor? Yeah, we're going to calculate on the side, we're going to calculate the Reynolds number, and we're going to calculate the relative roughness, and then we're going to go to the Moody diagram or the Churchill equation or some other equation, depending on, it's, it's probably turbulent flow, uh, and then get it. I think I have a plot of the Moody diagram. 
good time to review for the exam, right? <laughs> we, I know we covered this a lot earlier, but we need to get that Reynolds number, and then we need to find our relative roughness, and then we can read off the friction factor here. Uh, you can also use analytically Colebrook, Churchill. There's a lot of correlations they've curved curve fit to this chart. Um, so, how do I calculate the Reynolds number? Yeah, it's what? Yeah, rho, velocity, diameter over the viscosity. Glad they gave me the fluid properties in the problem statement. Uh, so that's covered. I just need the velocity. To get the velocity, that's not too hard. The velocity is equal to the volumetric flow rate divided by the area of the pipe, cross-sectional area of the pipe. They give it to me in, uh, this is the volumetric flow rate and the area of the pipe based on the diameter. It's doable, true? true? So um, let me see if I can pull up my numbers here. Maybe I can't. <laughs> um, where are my notes on this problem? Great. Threw it away or something. Yeah. So 1.5 times 10 to the 6. And then what about the roughness? Two, three, three zeros, right? Then 8, 2. Jump to the Moody diagram. Find the right uh, line. It's around here for the relative roughness. And it's a little over 10 to the 6, right? So we're looking at, I don't know, right in this vicinity. And then you read off that friction factor a little bit below 0.02. Okay. So once I have 0.02, and I know it's not precisely 0.02, it's 0.09 something, 0.019 something. But I'm able to then uh, calculate this uh, one-half rho v squared. Um, the head loss, you can put it in terms of pressure, energy per unit mass, or energy per unit weight, which is truly the head most people would talk about. We've done that a number of times. The only thing that changes is this right here. Do I put one-half rho v squared for pressure? Do I put one-half v squared for energy per unit mass, or do I put V squared over 2G? Either one. Go there. And then I'll change this from pressure to, I'm just repeating myself, energy head or elevation head. Okay. So um, what's interesting is this is a major part and that's a major part. There's two of these, right? These dominate the flow resistance. It's about 50-50. I know that these contribute some. But the two heat exchangers, you really have to push them through. There's a lot of pressure drop, a lot of head loss pushing flow through the heat exchanger. And uh, you have a large pipe, long distance of pipe, and you get some uh, head loss there. So tell me what, what the final number for this problem is. I solved it last semester, of course. 84 meters, or 285 feet. 84 meters, or so this is the head loss. I strongly encourage you to be able to solve a problem like that quickly. True? OK. Now, take the same problem. And what you want to do is you want to not operate at the nominal flow rate. This was our nominal flow rate. But operate at a slightly higher or slightly lower flow rate. Let's do a range of flow rates. And it's the same exact thing. Here is our head loss that we just calculated around 84 meters or 275 feet. Well, what happens if I change it to 4,000, to 3,000, and 2,000? And how would I go about doing that? Well, what I have here covered up is those detailed calculations. So 
I know it's an Excel spreadsheet, but that's the way it makes life easier. So here are the different flow rates. And once you have it in GPM, you can easily convert it to meter cube per second and kind of working in both system of units. But once I have an SI, then I have the velocity. Notice that the base case had around 4.3, and there was that Reynolds number, one point, what is that, nine times 10 to the six Reynolds number, or one point five. And then uh, as you start slowing it down, the velocity goes down, the Reynolds number goes down. Let's take a look at the Moody diagram. You're still going to be on a line like this for the constant relative roughness, but you're going to be decreasing the Reynolds number. How strongly does that friction factor change? Well, depends. I mean, are you going to decrease it so much that you're down here in the laminar flow? I don't know. But what did we start at? 5,000 GPM. Here is zero GPM. And so you can just visually interpolate between these. And so let's say this is uh, one, two, three, four. So right here would be about 4,000 GPM. Did the friction factor change a lot? No. How about 3,000 GPM? It's changing a little bit, but it's still not, it's not like changing by orders of magnitude. Look, at we had a significant reduction in the volumetric flow rate. You almost cut it in half. The friction factor changes a little bit. So anyway, if you come over, and I think I used a, uh, the root built-in routine, you can have the Churchill equation. And take a look at how that friction factor's changed. It's changed some, yeah, but it's not dramatic in change. 0.02. All right. This is a 3 times 10 to the fifth. Oh, I forgot. I messed up on that. Let me go back, erase this. This is a log scale. Ah, you, you can't do what I just did on the log scale. <laughs> so sorry. So the Reynolds number, you're really only changing in a small region in here because of the log scale. Just exactly what I want to point out, I botched it. Sorry about that. So this changes very little. It actually goes up to, a, the Reynolds number goes down from about 1 times 10 to the 5th, time, 3 times 10 to the 5th. So 1 times 10, 1.5 times 10 to the 6th to about 3 times 10 to the 5th. Where is 3 times 10 to the 5th? Right around here, right? And that's all it's changed, only in that region right in there. So even myself, I can get fooled a lot by thinking, oh, it's going to dramatically change. And even though you're dramatically changing the flow rate, the friction factor isn't changing much. And so if the friction factor doesn't change much, then the FL over D doesn't change much. Let's take a look at the other components. Your other components didn't change at all. The two heat exchangers, the elbows, their loss coefficient stayed the same. The total major and minor, of just the FL over D plus some of the Ks, you can see that it didn't change much. And even I, I uh, tabulated the change right here from our base case of 100%. By decreasing the flow from 5,000 to 1,000 GPM, that's a significant decrease in flow. The, the it was only a one uh, 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 around a 2.5 percent increase in the loss coefficients that multiply the dynamic velocity pressure or the dynamic head. But here, this part of the loss coefficient v squared divided by 2g. That changes a lot. It's a strong function. So when we had our equation for the head loss, it was made up of two parts. This F, sometimes they'll put equivalent over D. They're combined the major and the minor into an equivalent length, boom. And that really doesn't change if you're changing the flow rate. And you have the uh, V squared divided by 2G. If I multiply by area, squared, 
area squared. This is the flow rate squared. And so you get a very startling, very nice that it, it happens this way, that the head loss is approximately uh, a constant times the flow rate squared. Very nice. It's quadratic. It's quadratic. And it's because this really doesn't get strongly affected, this FL over D, uh, but all of it's in this dynamic pressure. So let me uncover the rest of this. So the head loss changes, the changes in the head loss follow the changes in the um, dynamic pressure. Yeah. Okay. It's, it's proportional to Q squared. And if you forgot and just said, well, I'm just going to use the constant at my nominal case, 5,000 GPM, you would do a very good job of predicting the head losses just using a very approximate formula where it's, see, this is an approximation. There's the detailed calculations. This is the approximation, detailed calculations, approximation, detailed calculations. And all we've done is we said, this constant I'm going to determine from the base case where that constant is the head loss at the 5,000 GPM divided by the flow rate at 5,000 GPM, then I can go back and say the head loss at any case is going to be the head loss at 5,000 GPM times the new flow divided by the 5,000 GPM uh, squared. Make sense? Okay. So you get a system curve for a closed loop piping system that goes through zero and is very nicely quadratic. Oh, it may not be exactly Q uh, squared. This coefficient, because of the friction factor, is a little different. But it's very close in a lot of cases to Q squared. And if you need to do back of the envelope calculations quickly without a computer code, there you go. So we have this system curve and we intersect it with the pump curve and what's that point called the operating point when I put this pump with that red pump curve into the system it will operate at that intersection point the operating point this will give me the flow rate and this will give me the head gain across the pump, which is precisely the head loss in the rest of the network to get the flow back to the inlet of the pump. So you have your pump there. You're thinking about the head gain or the pressure that's called the head gain across a pump. And this is the head loss around the loop. They are precisely the same at that operating point. Almost too easy, isn't it? So the intersection of the pump curve and the system curve gives you the operating point. Now, you have the same thing, but what did we introduce right here? A control valve. Well, sometimes valves are used to isolate pieces of equipment so you can go in and service it, take it out while the system's still running, right? Wouldn't it be annoying if UTSA said, oh, we have to service a valve in the engineering building, so for the next day or two, you're going to have no air conditioning. It's not acceptable. <laughs> it's not acceptable. So they always have isolation valves so they can isolate equipment and service and redundancy. That's smart. But uh, the control valve has a different function. And what does the control valve? Well, it's by the name. Controls something. What's it going to control? The flow. How is it going to control it? by turning the valve. If you turn the valve, you start to close it. What happens when you start to close a valve? What is the loss coefficient across that valve? What does it do? It goes up, the loss coefficient. There's a greater pressure drop across the valve. What are you trying to do? Introduce no, more flow resistance to reduce the flow through the network, through the pipe, piping system. So here's case A, B, and C. 
I'm saying that all of them have the same heat exchanger, the same number of isolation valves, the same number of elbows, the same length of pipe, and three of them are system curves, but they have one valve more partially closed or more open. Which, way, which case is the valve more closed, A, B, or C? More closed. Which one's more closed? The valve is, is closed more than the other two cases. C. It's curling it up. That's all it's doing. Let's say we close this valve completely, right? If I close this valve completely and it holds, and the motor's still running, the pump's still running, not good to do, what will be the flow through the system? What will be the flow through this heat exchanger if I close that valve completely? Zero. Right? Will be to flow through this heat exchanger. Zero. You just keep going and you get to where the system curve is. Boom. <laughs> it's so, it has such a large K that it's uh, pretty much a straight line up. And then you put your pump curve in it, and even for the completely closed, you get zero flow. But this is where it was completely open. And then we close the valve. So what does the operating point do? It stays on the pump curve. We haven't changed the pump, but we're changing the system curves. And so the operating point starts to roll back. And you're going to get lower flow, lower flow, lower flow, lower flow. But you're going to get increased pressure gain across the pump, meaning increased pressure loss in the rest of the system. Because the head loss in the system is equal to the head gain in the pump. I just have one pump, one network. The pressure is just being lost, the friction you're pounding against the ground. Yep, ground. that's exactly right. So there's two methods to control or reduce the flow rate in your piping system. Often engineers design things for the maximum, let's say the hottest day, needing the most air conditioning in the building over there. Right? They don't want a bunch of calls on the hottest day saying stuff don't work and I'm sweating to death. Uh, that's not good for the engineer. So they always design it for those, those extremes to be able to accommodate or close enough to the extreme. Uh, and then most days aren't the extreme. So most times you don't need all that flow. So what do you want to do? You want to slow it down, save some money. So there's two methods. There's more than two, I'm sure, but here's two methods to reduce the flow rate in a piping system. One is to partially close a control valve. Another method is to slow down the motor, which drives the pump. What do you mean by slow it down? Rotate at a lower speed. If you rotate at a lower speed, it's not going to throw out such a high pressure. So this one is out there still in practice. But about, oh, 15 years ago, um, 20 years ago, uh, this really took off, where you slow down the motor. You put it and slow it down, okay? Um, but before, let's say if you go into a building, well, I know this building's been retrofitted with all the uh, you know, things to slow it down, variable speed drives or variable frequency drives to slow motors down. But when it was built, I don't think any... VFDs were in this building, late 80s. I, I'm not positive of that. I'm just pretty certain of it. Okay. So uh, before uh, mid 90s, um, when buildings were built, uh, you basically um, tried to match the motor perfectly, and then you put in valves and you tried to close them a little bit. And you probably, if you get out there and look around, you'll probably see that still in practice. So let's study a little bit more about this wasteful closing by a control valve. Why is it so wasteful? Well, let's take this as our operating curve right here. This is our operating point or system curve. That's our operating point in our pump. Let's say I wanted to close it from, to, from 5,000 GPM to 4,000 GPM. Just, just reduce the flow by 20%, right? Well, I'm going to have to put another curve that's going to go through zero, have the same shape, but has a greater loss that K has been added by closing a valve in addition to the other Ks 
and in addition to the FL over D, such that one half rho V squared uh, is equal to, um, this flow goes down, true, but I've increased the K. It's, I want it to still match the pump. The, the pump almost is flat. Can you see that? But it, it has some curvature to it. So let's do it graphically. If you do it graphically, can you see where the new operating point is? Just happens to be where 4,000 GPM looks like it hits right around 300 foot of head gain the pump is providing. True? Okay, let me ask this. What was it before in the original case? What was the number I just wrote? 200 and what was it again? 275. So 275 is close to 300, but it's not precisely. There's a little curvature in that pump curve. So a lot of people would say, well, that valve had to accommodate uh, 25 uh, 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 meters, no feet, 25 foot of additional head drop. But is that true? What's, if I go back and I look at, here's my valve, I partially closed it. The flow used to be 5,000 GPM. Now it's 4,000 GPM. Somebody looks at the pump curve, says, yeah, the pump now has to work harder. It used to put out 275. Now it's putting out 300 foot of head gain across the pump. That must mean that the pressure loss or the head loss across that valve is 25 foot. Is that true or not? Yes. The reason I ask that is so easy to get messed up in your mind. Okay? Well, let me ask you this. The rest of the system is not having the same flow rate, is it? It's still, it's now only experiencing 4,000 GPM. It's, it's maybe a way to write this equation is to write it this way. Write it that you're going to have the head loss in the valve that now has been partially closed and the head loss in the rest of the system, which the rest of the system is experiencing 20% lower flow rate. It's only experiencing 4,000 GPM. So... It's misleading to think that the valve is taking only 25 foot of head loss across it. Going back to this curve, here is our system curve without the valve being closed. That visually is an indication of the head loss through the major, the elbows, all those other components except the control valve, which was completely open. This is what it used to be. Well, I can take a look and I can see that it's around about, what, 175 feet. That means across the valve, it's 175 up to 300. That head loss across the valve is 125 feet. Do you see that? This is what you want to do, push it through the heat exchanger. You have to push it through the pipes. That's just part of life. This is waste. This, this is just waste right here. This part is just waste. Well, well, it's not complete waste. It's waste just to control it, to slow it down. And you can calculate what is the horsepower Let's do the fluid horsepower, which is just to push the water across the partially closed valve. Wouldn't that be the product of, depending on what you want to do with it, you want to do it with um, the, um, let's do it this way, the, the volumetric flow rate times G, whoops, that's a bad looking G, isn't it? <laughs> times G, what does that give me? Rho G times Q gives me the, okay, let's, yeah, G, doesn't this, um, here, do this, 
What's rho times Q? This is volumetric flow rate. That's mass flow rate. That I multiply by G. What does that give me? Weight flow rate. True? So that's my weight flow rate. And if I multiply by the energy per unit weight, which is my elevation head, if I multiply by that head loss in the valve, I'll get the fluid horsepower that's just being wasted. It's being dissipated. It's mechanical fluid power that's being dissipated by across a valve. It'll be a little warmer. The fluid will come out a little warmer across that valve. That's what it's going to. Energy is conserved, but not the mechanical energy. It's being lost from the mechanical to thermal through friction. So um, let's do this. It was a 4,000 GPM. And you can get that uh, this is around uh, 64 uh, pounds uh, force uh, per uh, cubic foot. And our head loss we estimated to be uh, how many? 175 uh, foot. True. How many people can make that calculation and tell me what is the horsepower? That's the fluid horsepower that's that's just being expended by pushing it across that valve. So we have 64 pound force per foot cube. You have the flow rate 4,000 gallons per minute. And you have 175 foot. And what do we need for how many gallons are in a cubic foot? 7.48 gallons per cubic foot. Is that right? That's the unit conversion. And then a minute, I'm going to say, uh, is uh, 60 seconds. And what's a uh, horsepower? What's a horsepower? 550 foot pound force per who has the equation sheet? What is it? 550 foot pound force. 7.46 No, I want it. Horsepower is 550 foot oh, pound. Foot pound force. Because we have everything already in gallons, pound force, feet. All right, you're making me work too. Oh, 550 pound force foot per second. Per second. That'll do it. So the seconds go, the gallons go, the cubic foot go, the pound force go, another foot goes, and you get the right units. So the fluid horsepower is how many horsepower? How many people get around 182? A couple more? Okay, well, uh, you, you can see that this is a wasteful strategy. It's been used, but that's the, that's the product of, of partially closing valves to control the flow rate. It's not the best option, and most it's, it's been eradicated. <laughs> it's gone uh, from many, many, many buildings, but you'll probably still see it out there in practice somewhere. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Different names, different purposes. So if I said um, that the motor is so much efficient, well then I can back that up to a higher horsepower. Well, let me do the pump efficiency. Then I back that up to a higher horsepower for the shaft power to get it into the fluid to then get it wasted in the valve. And then if I say, okay, um, the motor is so much efficient, then this ends up being a lot more electricity than just that 181.5 fluid horsepower. 
All right. So how can you reduce the speed of an alternating current induction motor? That's the predominant workhorse out there. That's the typical three-phase motor that's in the buildings and a lot of applications. How can you reduce the speed? Can, well, how about you just tighten down on the output shaft, um, increase the torque, resistance. Will that do it? Decrease the voltage of the alternating current electricity supplying it. Decrease the frequency of the alternating current supplying it. It can't be done, or it can be done, but by other means, something else. Well, a lot of people will do this, especially in labs and grad students, high school, not high school, but, you know, sometimes people do, need to do an experiment. Oh, I want to slow this down. I'll get a variac. It's like a changing the voltage, and they'll do that to an AC induction motor. And after a while, you'll be able to smell the burnt up motor. Uh, decreasing the voltage is a big no, no. And I tried to explain that last time. What happens? You actually get more slip. The current goes up through the windings, higher dissipation of energy in the windings, hotter windings. It melts the insulation coating. It gets short circuits in the windings, and it burns up pretty, pretty, can be pretty catastrophic. Transformers in power plants? But they're dropping it to a specific voltage. If they're not changing frequency, they're just tr dropping it to a voltage. When you have a power line, that's not 120 volts in the power line. It's very high voltage. That The balloon people, right, that had that terrific accident in Caldwell County when they got caught in the power line, had a lot higher voltage than what we get anywhere in this building. And there's transformers all over. To step up the voltage, especially when you want to transmit it over long distances, you step it up so that the current is very small. And you deliver a lot of power. But then when you get near people, you step it down. And you just don't need that high voltage in pieces of equipment. And uh, even over in the shop, they don't, they, they're looking at the new building and having some equipment over there, they're like, we don't need 480. We don't want 480 or higher voltages for some of the equipment. We just want 240 and below. It's good enough for our needs. So anyway, uh, high voltage, low current. Okay. So uh, also, this is a brownout. Uh, anybody heard of blackouts? Utility has a blackout. What happens? They cut the power. They lost the power. You're without power. True. But what if, what's the alternative to a blackout? A brownout. What's a brownout? They don't give you 120 volts. The plot, the supplier of electricity is having a hard time delivering it. It's trying to push it out and there's more people needing it, wanting it. Maybe they lost a power plant or some other source and they'll let the voltage drop. Maybe, uh, if you stuck your wires and tested the voltage in our plugs here, it, it, it's probably about 122 volts AC. I've done it a number of times with a good meter just to check it. It fluctuates some. Uh, typically, people will talk about 120 volts AC. It's never spot on 120. They try and keep it around 120. That's the kind of give and take. There's no storage of electricity. When it's made, it's consumed. And if there's a loss of production in the grid, it creates problems. But anyway, a brownout, this will drift down. I think they'll go down to 110 volt AC that'll still run. Uh, but then it'll get dangerously low. And because it'll burn up a lot of your equipment, both in your businesses and as well as your houses, they will not allow a brownout to go. They'll cut it. They'll give you zero. <laughs> and there'll be a blackout. And then what happens then is the utility is trying to do rolling blackouts. Okay, we killed this subdivision for this many hours. Let's give them electricity. Let's kill this subdivision for a couple hours. That's a rolling blackout. It's managed by the utility. Um, so these are no-no from utility, no-no from a very act and experimentalist trying to reduce the voltage. You try and change the frequency. Well, 60 
hertz. And the utility works very good to keep it precisely 60 hertz because so many electronics are dependent on the frequency of the current, not necessarily the voltage, like clocks and stuff. So it's well managed right at 60 hertz. And you don't want to be trying to mess with that. And if you did, it would lead to another problem that would cause issues with your motor. Uh, don't try and add torque to the motor. That won't work. Basically, what you have to do, it can be done, but you have to reduce the voltage and the frequency together in parallel, such that when you reduce the voltage, the frequency of the current is coming down. But the utility is only supplying, in the United States, 60 hertz. What's it in Mexico? Is it 60 hertz or 50? Who knows? Most of Europe is 50 hertz, or Japan, right? Japan's 50 hertz. Anybody been where they brought back electronics or shipped electronics across and they like plug it in, it won't work because <laughs> it's a uh, different frequency. I know my brother was in the Navy. He had some equ equipment like that. You just have to abandon it <laughs> or sell it when you're over there, and then when you come back, get new. You can get another converter for it, but it's not worth it typically. A lot of it's home electronics. They're going to be outdated in five years anyway. I know I bought the speaker for the rest of my life when I was 18, and, you know, stereo system when I was 18. It's going to be good for the rest of my life. What's it last? Five years? Six years? <laughs> then it's out on the junk pile. Well, um, this little box, and that's all they look like, but they have uh, really had a big impact on how you control motors and fluid systems. There are different names, a variable frequency drive, that's what I typically call it, a variable or adjustable frequency drive, variable speed drive, AC drive, inverter drive, just a bunch of names for it. Go ahead and look at Wikipedia and other places. Um, basically, they control the speed of the standard alternating current induction. We're not going to talk about synchronous motors. Most of the motors you see out there are induction. So it's going to not run precisely at the 1800 RPM or, or another increment like that. It'll have a little slip speed, and that's what gives it the torque and, and, and uh, makes it the motor. Uh, the synchronous means it runs right at that speed. It's in sync. Uh, forget all that. I'm not trying to teach motors. But what they do is they take in that standard voltage, standard frequency into this black magical box that the electrical engineers control. And it comes out with a chopped power supply. And they can make it change the frequency. And they can make it change. It still be sinusoidal, even though I didn't make it look very sinusoidal. And they can change the voltage. And what the motor gets that AC induction motor isn't nice, it's not a nice sine wave. It's pulse width modulation. It's chopped up sine wave pieced together. Uh, there's a great websites from different manufacturers of equipment. So this is that box. You bring in three phase current. It goes out three phase, but it is not sinusoidal to the motor. It's chopped. Um, well, there's a quick introduction to VFDs. And the pump manufacturers know that. And so what they do is they have on their pump curves, they'll show you that this red line right here is at their nominal 1760 RPM running speed for the motor. But they'll also, in the software that they give you or that you can download, they give you what the pump uh, curve looks like when that motor is given a, a, a lower uh, RPM. So when it's 1430 and 1100 and 770 and 440. And so now you can see that they're going to modulate the pump by controlling the motor. And now you can walk that, you can walk down without closing a valve, same system, you can go from 5,000 GPM down to 4,000 GPM, and the pump will be running. It looks like it needs to be running at around 1430 RPM instead of the 1760 RPM, 
What's going to do that? The VFD, the little box on the wall <laughs> hanging next to the motor that supplies the lines, you know, to the motor. And the, the new motor pump curve looks like that, and that's the operating point. Where's the waste? The waste is gone. The waste of pushing it through a partially closed control valve is gone. It's great for efficiency, a lot lower energy use. You said the way to do it was to reduce the voltage and the rate of change of current simultaneously? Yes. These are doing it. They're changing both the voltage and the frequency. I didn't put together more discussion of what is, is it a one-to-one, -one or a one-to-three, one-to-two, or anything like that. I didn't do anything like that. It's proportional, though. Yep. Now we have talked about closed systems and controlling the flow rate in a closed system. We want to now talk about open systems. So what's the difference between an open and a closed? Well, there's a break. <laughs> Maybe you're moving fluid from one tank to another tank, and it's not closed coming back. Or maybe this does have a drain that comes out and uh, does something crazy by going over and spilling out into this tank. Maybe like a water fountain, right? A uh, water fountain, you know, they have pumps and the pump discharges and it goes and there's a little nozzle here that shoots water up, true? And then the water is going to fall into a pool and that pool then supplies the pump. That's a little water fountain. Uh, this would be not a closed system, an open system, because there's a break. It's, it's atmospheric pressure right there, guaranteed. And um, let's analyze, though, the system that I've sketched. So we, what we want to do is we want to determine the flow rate for the pump piping system used to move water from one large tank to a higher tank, the lower elevation to a higher elevation. So take Bernoulli, start with Bernoulli, and go just like this. Out. Should I take the, where should I end that Bernoulli? Should I end it down here at that water surface? No, I have to end it right there. Because when it's sprayed out, there's a lot of friction and a lot of air, and it breaks up. And So you can't take that down to here. That's a mistake. You end it right there. So from state one, let's call this one, to two. And we just write our Bernoulli's equation modified for pumps and head losses. So we'll do it in terms of pressure. Pressure at 1 plus 1 half rho V1 squared plus rho GZ1 plus we do have a pressure gain due to the pump equal to the pressure at 2 plus 1 half rho V2 squared plus rho GZ2 uh, plus the pressure loss due to major and minor, just pushing it through the system. Okay, let's cancel out the terms. What is the pressure at 1 compared to the pressure at 2? Atmospheric pressure. Okay, what about this 1 half rho V1 squared? It's a large tank. How about 1 half rho V2 squared? Is that 0? No, it's being... I like to say it's being spit out the pipe with some speed. That term's not zero. Okay, the elevation definitely is not zero. We have the pump right here. So let's put that over here. The pump, the pressure gained by the pump is equal to, just reading it this way, uh, rho g z2 minus z1 plus one half rho v2 squared plus pressure loss in the piping system, the major, minor. Now we can see the pump has to lift it, has to spit it. I don't, maybe I should, you make a, what, you don't like the word spit. Let's, let's, give me another word for, it's throwing it out the end of the pipe. Eject it. Okay, there you go. I don't know if I like eject either. Spew, Spew it. You like spew? There you go. Spew. I don't know if I spelled it right. How do you spell spew? That's close enough, right? And then what about this one? It's to overcome the friction. It has to overcome the friction. So you see what the pump has to do, right? 
primarily you're interested in lifting it. Uh, but it's going to spew it, and it's also going to overcome the friction in the system. So uh, if I look at this one, we've analyzed this one already. It's going to be a constant times the flow rate squared. And this one right here is, is just, um, if I put an area there and an area there, an area squared and an area squared, it's just another constant times the flow rate squared, the different constant. And then what about this term right here? Does it depend on the flow? Does it depend on the flow rate? It's just a constant. So maybe I should say C0, C1, and C2. All right. Or you can combine these because both of them are um, proportional to the flow rate. So C1, maybe C3, Q squared, C0, pressure gain of the pump. So really what you've written right here is that this is the pressure ah, pressure um, of the system that the pump has to match. And so if I have my uh, pump curve, I put it on a uh, head or pressure versus flow rate, and this is the pump. And what we're going to have is a system. We used to have closed systems, they always went through the origin and they were always that the, the pressure of the system is some constant Q squared, approximately. But what does this new form look like? It looks like A plus B Q squared, if I just want to change the coefficients. It has some non-zero starting point at the origin and it has the qu traditional quadratic shape. So this is for an open, this is for closed. The big difference, right there. It's an offset. It's quadratic, but it's offset. Let's do this. Let's say I put too small a pump in there, a very, very weak pump, okay, a weak pump. The weak pump needs to be able to lift this by, I don't know, let's say this distance, elevation distance is 200 foot. But the weak pump, the, the max gain across it is 50 foot. What's the pump going to do when I put the too weak, too little pump in, you know, to do this job? It'll have no flow coming out the end. You're right. It'll pump it up to a certain level in the pipe, and it'll just sit there, and the rest of the pipe system will be filled with air. There'll be nothing spewing out the end. No flow. Right? It's like I put this pump into it. It didn't even have a good operating point where it's having a flow. I have to put a big enough pump such that I get the operating point here. Let's say I want the operating point further out. Get a stronger pump, and then you'll move the operating point further out. So keep those equations, you just multiply everything by a squared over a squared? Like both sides? Right? Um, the basic equation is, is that always the pump gain across the pump, you know, the, the gain across the pump equals the loss in the piping and the elevation change, and the effect of spewing it out the end. And so, so uh, uh, let me see if I can clean this up. I tried to make a big difference. So like, these are proportional to, this is, let me try this one. So the pump, the gain from the pump is equal to, at the operating point, the loss, uh, losses uh, due to the lift, and let me say spew and uh, uh, major minor frictional. And this is a constant. These are both going to give you something Q squared. That gives us a quadratic form uh, with the A constant and then B Q squared. So that's the shape of this one. 
it's a plus b q squared instead of just c q squared for a closed system. And b is just whatever is required to make that term. Oh, this lowercase b right here? Like, like there, yeah, like the b in front of the q squared, like that, that yeah. term will include a squared over a squared. Or something like that. Well, it'll, if you want, okay, remember this form right here and that I'm combining it. So basically, um, this will look like this. It'll have F, L over D, the major loss, plus some of the Ks for fittings and elbows. Maybe there's a valve in there too. Plus one for the spewing. The spewing. And then it'll have uh, um, one half, uh, depending what you want. Do you want it in head or pressure? It'll be the one half row. Uh, Q squared, then you put over A squared. Right? All right. So uh, let's change it up a little bit. Insert new page. Let's say I have the tank is up here. And I'm going to take the fluid out, put it through a pump, and uh, then put it into this lower tank. So that's the direction of the flow, and it'll spew out down here. Well, what's going to happen there? Well, you're going to have, yeah, you don't even need a pump. You could, you could just let it drain. It, it, it would work, true. And so what happens there is, is um, let's say our pump curve is up here, but what's our system curve look like? Our system curve it actually is going to have, it it's intersects at a negative uh, A, so to speak, and it is quadratic up. See, instead of having this where it's positive, it's actually negative. Just conceptually, put the two tanks change their, their uh, respective elevations. What does it do? Okay, do this. Before you go that extreme, take it and put it into a tank with the same elevation. Right? You just knocked out, you just knocked out if it's the same elevation, the water levels are the same. You just knocked out the delta Z in the equation. Yeah, here is one curve that I've shown. And so then you would just match with the pump. That would be the operating point. Let's talk about pumps in series and pumps in parallel. So if I have, what does it mean to have two pumps that are in series and two pumps that are in parallel? Well, maybe I should draw the two pumps in series like this. Yeah. Yeah, the pressure gain from one plus the pressure gain from the second is the total pressure gain. If they come like this, what you have is you have the flow through one and the, the flow through two. So the flow through one plus the flow through two is equal to the flow total. That's in parallel. And the pressure gain... 1 is equal to the pressure gain 2. What about the flow here? The flow through 1 is equal to the flow through 2. So when they're in series, the same flow and the pressures are additive. When they're in parallel, the same uh, pressure gain and the flows are additive. So head is summative when two pumps are connected in series or parallel. The head is our pressure, is summative when they're in series. And the flow or capacity rate, the flow rate or the capacity is summative when two pumps are connected in parallel. There's a quick little problem. Three pumps are connected in parallel. So we want to go ahead and show in parallel. One, two, three, comes into a manifold, goes out, collects in a manifold, and goes. 
The shutoff head for each pump, what do they mean by the shutoff? That's the maximum head that can be generated is uh, 7 meters, 10, and 15 meters. If the net head for the system is to be 10 me or 9 meters, which pumps uh, should be shut off or isolated? Should you uh, close off pump 1, close off pump 2, close off pump 3? Well, this one's too small. So isolate pump 1. You, st you only need 9 meters. This one can do it, and this one can do it. But this one's insufficient to do it. It should be isolated. It won't work. What I need to cover also is pump affinity laws. There's a few things you'll see out of this class which are on the FE exam. What's one of them? What is the Reynolds number, inertial to viscous? Basically a multiple choice question. Do you know what the Reynolds number is? It's probably about a 30 to 50% probability that question will be on there in, in a different form, but that's a basic idea. Um, velocity, pressure, drags, things like that. But pump affinity loss, there's a high probability they'll be on there. And this is affinity loss for pumps as well as for fans. Okay. So what does this word affinity mean? Look it up. So similar in characteristics. There's a relationship in the structure of the relationships between the pumps what are, and fans. What are we mo most interested in? Flow rates. We're interested in head or pressure. And we're interested in, let me call it, uh, fluid uh, horsepower, some brake horsepower, fluid horsepower, some power. Those are the three things we're really interested in. And once you have a pump and you just build a larger pump, but it's just scaled up, the way they behave is very, very similar. So if you change the dimensions of the pump, you can scale the results through the affinity laws because they have the same characteristics, same shape. Same behavior. The same thing, you can have two pumps that are the same, but you start changing the speed. And so this is what you do, is you start in the derivation of the affinity laws. Again, it's not just for pumps, but it's nice to say pump affinity laws. It's for fans as well. With a dimensional analysis, and you say, I'm really interested in what is, what is this uh, GH what would that indicate? You're interested in GH. I know it's a funny way of writing it, but what would that give me an interpretation of words of what they mean by GH? All right, let's start easier. Let's start. What is this mu? Viscosity of the flowing fluid. What is rho? Density. What is omega? It's the rotational speed of the pump, which the, is the shaft supplying it. You can think about it. Okay, that's omega. What's epsilon? It's got a little surface roughness to the material in there, the walls of the pump and the impeller. What is D? Diameter of the impeller, especially of the pump. And if you are scaling it, then, then the diameter of the impeller, diameter of the casings, they change as well. As well as maybe uh, if you're changing this diameter, you're going to let the other uh, width of the change as well. So it's going to be a geometric, but usually it's linked to the diameter of the impeller. This uh, kind of funny V dot, what is that? It's what I've been putting as Q, volumetric flow rate. Volumetric flow rate. Okay, so this is how the diameter, the size, the speed, the fluid, the surface roughness, and the flow rates related to G times H. What is maybe H? Some head, right? And so what is G? Gravity. But a lot of times you remember G is 9.81 meters per second squared. Ah, can't write it. Meters per second squared. Or you remember it 
newtons per kilogram. So it's uh, the weight per unit mass. Okay. So why did they multiply by G? What is this a measure of? Energy increase of the fluids going through. Isn't that the H, the, 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 the change in the head? Okay. All right. This G times H, if H is in units of meter, then you have meter squared per second squared. Maybe that's an easy one to think of. And what is that? That's uh, energy per unit mass. Or if you put a meter there, you have a newton meter divided by kilogram. Joule per kilogram. This is basically the increase in the, ener the fluid energy through the pump. Well, you count up and you say, how many uh, parameters do we have? Seven. How many basic um, primary dimensions do we have? Three. What do you think the three are going to be? Length. Length. Mass. Time. That's the three. And so you expect how many... Pi groups for a dimensional analysis of this problem, four. And here is one of the pi groups. Let's look at the easiest one. What is that one? You recognize it? Rough, relative roughness. Okay, this one's a little harder, but it's recognizable. Look at the rho over mu. Oh, that looks like our Reynolds number. I just need to have an omega d times d. That omega d acts like the v, velocity. Omega d is like a velocity, and d is a length scale. So that's our Reynolds number. So two of these are easy. This is relative roughness and a Reynolds number. I know it's a Reynolds number based on omega d as the velocity. But now, what about uh, the next easiest one, this pi 2? Well, it's a dimensionless what? What did, what, did they, what did they make dimensionless? What's in the numerator of that ratio? Volumetric flow rate. It's a dimensionless volumetric flow rate. They normalize the flow rate. And then what is this other one, which is the most complicated? Pi 1. What's in the numerator of that? That's the dimensionless energy gain or head gain of the fluid through the system. So once you have these four pi groups, there's been a lot of people looked at this problem over the years. You can think about, um, let me do it this way. You can think about characterizing the pump performance where you're going to plot, oh, I don't know, let's do this. Let's plot pi group um, one as a function of pi group two for uh, for um, for uh, a constant pi group 3 and a constant pi group 4. So let these be constant. What do you mean by constant? You're not changing the roughness of the material and you're not changing the speed of the material. And you're not changing the fluid either. The fluid is the same going through it. But what did you change? The volumetric flow rate. So this pi group 2 is a dimensionless volumetric flow rate. They give it a name, uh, capacity coefficient. Isn't that the same as our pi group 2 right here? And they maybe give it a different symbol, just like a Reynolds number. Was a, this is a, We're going to give that a name, a Reynolds number. Okay, so this axis could be cast as dimensionless. Instead of GPM, you can put it normalized GPM, and that's the flow capacity rate. Over here, that was our head. It's our normalized head, and that's given the name. Oops, uncover. That's given the, head, the name head coefficient. All right. Uh, it's just a dimensionless head. And so now the pump curve casts in dimensionless form. And there's our characteristic, C sub H. But that's not the only thing of interest. 
What did they leave out of possibly of interest is something like break horse power. But what is our power? Our power has always been the capacity times the head, has it not? Isn't the power, fluid power, the capacity times the head? So they take this and multiply the two together. If you multiply the two together, the volumetric flow rate times this energy per unit. I know that they um, need to put a row in here. If you put a row right there, if you put a row times CQ times CH, you get a new dimensionless, and the numerator is the brake horsepower, or the, what I would call fluid horsepower. Brake horsepower is the shaft to supply to the pump. This is what's getting into the fluid. Okay, But you have a dimensionless uh, power coefficient. And so on the, that could be a function of the dimensionless flow rate too, and that would be um, um, cast as um, actually the dimensionless power coefficients right here. And then you measure it, the fluid horsepower to the brake horsepower, you get the efficiency. So a lot of people have looked at these pumps and have cast it in dimensionless terms, identified these um, coefficients, and now you're ready to develop relationships to scale between one pump that's here shown to be a little larger than another pump who's smaller, but everything else is the same. And the, if you're interested in uh, these scaling or affinity laws or relationships, law is probably too strong of a term, but everybody uses it. You're interested in how the flow changes, how the head changes, and how the power changes. So three things. Well, how would the flow change if I'm changing the diameter? Would it be, you know, guess, would it be diameter of a B divided by diameter of A, you know, maybe square it? So flow rate change is function of the diameter, the size, or maybe not, maybe it's linear, maybe it's the square root, or omega over omega, you know, the mega B, is it going faster compared to a slower? You know, how, does, how do these things change as a function of them? Well, the flow rate, if you understand one, the next one falls in. The, the, um, it's easy to, I think it's easier to understand how the flow rate affects it. What you're doing is in that I region, you have these impellers and they're slicing in and bringing into it fluid. And as I increase the rotational speed of the I region, the impeller section, I'm linearly slicing off more of the fluid and pushing it through. So it's proportional. The harder one is this diameter to the cube power. But you can go back. Let me see if I can go back. And to get this to be dimensionless, you not only have omega, you have d cubed. And so from the capacity coefficient, you get that if I'm changing the speed or if I'm changing the size of the same similar pumps, then I am scaling the volumetric flow rate as shown, proportional to omega, proportional to d cubed. Which one do we use more often? Speed, especially with the advent of variable speed drives. Now, let's go to the next one. What about the head? Well, you go back to here. Here's the head. It's omega squared d squared. So it's omega squared d squared. Why... I like to think about why it's proportional to omega squared. That makes sense to me. How does it make sense to me? Think not about the eye region of the impeller. Think about the outer region of the impeller. And when it comes off the tip of the impeller, it has a high kinetic energy, and the kinetic energy is proportional to the rotational speed at the tip. So it's the, v, the kinetic energy coming off is going to be converted, a lot of it, back into head, 
and so it's one half rho v squared. The v squared is the critical part. And that v squared is omega d on the outer squared. It's proportional to omega squared. The head is proportional to omega squared. The impeller takes a little more thinking of why it's that. I just look back at the uh, dimensionless coefficient. But what about the brake horsepower? Well, just remember that the product of these give us the horsepower. And when you do that, you can just see that you pick up the omega to the cubed, because you get its omega here and omega squared. You get these to the fifth, which is phenomenal. And then it does factor in with the density if you're going to change the density of the fluid. This is less common to change the density of the fluid. It's more common to talk about changing the speed, that's the most common, and a little bit changing the diameter. But the big ones are right here, right here, and right there. Let's uh, solve a problem. A pump delivers 10 meters of head and 44 liters per minute at a rotational speed of 1,200 RPM. If the pump efficiency is 83%, predict the brake horsepower. So that shouldn't be too hard. That's part A, right? So you have the pump delivers 10 meters of head it, at a flow rate of 44 liters per minute. So what is the fluid horsepower? It's going to be the head times the flow rate with some to make it work, this is this is energy per unit weight. This is volume per unit time. So just looking at it, I have energy per unit weight, volume per unit time. I need to also multiply by weight per unit volume. So the weight, it, it will be the mass per unit volume, rho times g, which is the weight per unit mass. So rho g is my weight per unit volume. And there you go. That'll work. True. So let's go ahead and calculate the fluid horsepower. 10 meters, uh, 44. Let's do the liters. So isn't it 0 .044 um, meter cubed? 1,000 liters is a meter cubed. So if I say 44 liters, isn't it 0 0.044 meter cubed? And then I have per minute, which is 60 seconds. So I did that conversion. And then I have rho g for the water. And it's going to be 9.81 newtons per kilogram. Uh, kilonewton, sorry. Kilo. You're right for the thousand kilograms. Did I do those three right? Okay, so what do we pick up? We're gonna have, uh, no, that's not, I got it messed up. Kilonewton per meter cubed, sorry. Yeah, now we get the conversion here. And we'll have kilonewton uh, times a meter, which is a kilojoule per second. And what do we pick up here for uh, kilowatts? Does that look okay? Okay. So that's how many kilowatts. That's the fluid horsepower. Now, the efficiency of the pump is uh, 83%. That's the ratio of what gets into the fluid divided by what was the brake horsepower. True? So if I, they asked me to predict the brake horsepower, the brake horsepower is 1 over 0.83 times the fluid horsepower. So the brake horsepower is 0 0.0867 horse, it's not horsepower, kilowatts.
I know that's funny, brake horsepower in kilowatts, but there you go. If you wanted to convert it to horsepower, you could. All right. If the rotational speed is decreased by 10%, calculate the new rotational speed. So you tell me what the new rotational speed is if it's decreased by 10%. I'm going to pause. I'm going to walk around. You can solve this problem. Then give me the volumetric flow rate. Then give me the pump head. Then give me the new brake horsepower. You just change the speed by 10%. Okay? I want you to do it. All right, so if the new rotational speed, it's been decreased by 10%, so it's 90% of the original rotational speed. And the original rotational speed is uh, 1,200 RPM. So what is omega-2? What's our new rotational speed? 1080 RPM, box it, call that the answer to part A. What about the volumetric flow rate? Well, we know from the affinity relationship, the volumetric flow rate is proportional to the speed. And so we write that like this. We'll say that the new volumetric flow rate divided by the old volumetric flow rate is the new rotational speed divided by the old rotational speed. And so what we find is that the new volumetric flow rates, the original volumetric flow rate times omega-2 divided by omega-1, but omega-2 divided by omega-1 was 0.9. So we had 44 liters per minute. You multiply by 0.9, and the new volumetric flow rates 39.6 liters per minute. Okay, that was easy. How about the pump head? Well, let's do that. The head is proportional to the flow, the rotational speed squared. And so the new head, I'm going to have to scroll down. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, I don't know how to fit this. So the new head is the old head times the new rotational speed, or old rotational speed squared. So it's 0.9 squared. When you put 0.9 squared, Instead of 90%, it's 81%. Instead of 90%, it's 81% of the head, which was 10 meters. H2 is equal to 8.1 meters. That's the answer for part uh, C. It has everything to do. When it comes off the tip, it's coming off at the speed proportional to omega times the outer diameter. Yeah. And that's then kinetic energy. That's what is in the volume section converted back into pressure by slowing down. You can think of that uh, volume section as a diffuser. It tries to slow it down and build the pressure at the expense of the speed. Okay. And then for the brake horsepower, well, the brake horsepower is proportional to the omega cubed. So the brake horsepower for the new case is the brake horsepower for the original case times, uh, well, 0.9, it's omega over omega cubed. And so 0.9 cubed is 73% of the brake horsepower, which is 0.08. Six seven, and so the brake horsepower for case two is 0 .0, uh, 0.0632 um, kilowatts. It goes as the sp rotational speed cubed. Okay. Okay. Wrap it up. Not all pumps are s centrifugal pumps where basically are kinetic energy pumps. They speed up the fluid, throw it out into like a volute section which slows it down and builds up the pressure. Some are positive displacement pumps. Here are some uh, examples. The peristolic pump where it's, you have a tube and the fluid's in the tube. If you just rotate this, it's going to take. And so a lot of hospitals, medical places, they want a guaranteed flow rate of medicine 
in the liquid form into a patient. There you go, that type of tube. You'll find uh, rotary or gear pumps. Where do you see a gear pump? Automobile engine, oil pump. True? Oil pumps. Uh, screw, uh, there's other pumps like that. They take a fixed volume and they change the volume and compress it. Uh, the characteristic curve of a pump like that is very steep. And if you get too high of a head, things break. So this is like no man's land above some recommended high head. But the performance is over this region is very, very steep. It's like I guarantee this flow no matter what type of resistance I encounter. That's usually the value of these things. Okay, So the oil pumps can really put out uh, a constant flow rate of oil to the critical components, even if they get a little dirty or a little worn or other things, you'll still get a lot of flow. So unfortunately, we are at the end of this section. Thank you for your attention.